Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We will continue our walk through the book of Philippians. I hope it's been for you what it has been for me. Just an incredible joy to walk through this deep, profound, joy-filled letter of the Apostle Paul. Granted, I do get more time in it throughout the week than you do. Um, I spend many hours studying and reading and meditating upon these texts and just the truths being pulled out enrich my soul. And so all I try to do on Sunday is stand here for hopefully 45 to 50 minutes and give what I've been feasting on all week to you. But we've been walking through the book of Philippians and we've been seeing the different sources of the Apostle Paul's joy in the Lord. And today we come to verses 12 to 18, this section, and we find the Apostle Paul giving an urgent plea to the Christians in Philippi to persevere unto the final day of Jesus Christ. This is an urgent plea for the Philippians to make it to the end. Let's read Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul, in these verses, as we'll discover in coming weeks, gives a command for the Philippians to persevere in their faith. That's verse 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But further, Paul demonstrates a concrete confidence in the sovereignty of God to preserve the Philippians in their faith. That's verse 13. He then gives not only a command to persevere, but he gives the prescription on how the Philippians can persevere. We see that in verses 14 and 16. Do all things without grumbling and complaining, he says in verse 14. In verse 16, he says, hold fast to the word of life. This is a prescription given for how you're to obey the command to make it unto the end. And he reveals in verses 16 through 18, the joy that he desires to experience in their perseverance. And what I want us to do as we go through this section and break down these verses and uncover these truths, I want us to actually begin with verses 16, 17, and 18 today, and then God willing, we'll go back and start again in verse 12 and work our way through the passage. And the reason I want to do that is because I want us to go back and kind of get the context of Philippians that we're in. Remember, this is an epistle of joy. And what Paul is doing is he's giving source after source of how he has joy in the Lord. And in these verses, we discover the fifth source of Paul's joy in the Lord. Namely, the perseverance of the saints. Paul wants the Philippians to survive. He wants them to persevere to the end. And it is that perseverance, that being blameless and innocent in the day of Christ, that brings joy to the Apostle Paul. So, remember what Paul is doing in this letter. With every section, with every thought, he is showing the Philippians the various sources of joy in the Lord. And he's really showing us 
how we can have that same joy. It's really fascinating. This epistle, you know, it's often called the epistle of joy. But when I began to study it and to outline it, I wanted to see, okay, does that theme hold true from beginning to end? It's amazing. Every section of thought, what's called a pericope, but every section of thought, it's not necessarily a paragraph, but it could be more than a paragraph, paragraph and a half, mentions joy. And Paul says, I rejoice, and gives a reason why. And so here we have the fifth reason why. Paul rejoices, and it is in the perseverance of the saints. Now, this is not simply, the joy that the Apostle Paul is teaching us about Philippians is not a simple superficial joy that is fleeting. That's a worldly joy in the pleasures of sin. It leaves as quickly as it comes, right? You notice about sin. Before you partake in sin, it promises you joy and satisfaction. After you participate, it, participate in it, you go, oh, this hasn't ended well. And you just need more of it to keep it going. Classic with sin, it's fleeting joy. But Paul's not speaking about that kind of joy in Philippians. Paul is revealing to the Philippians, and thus to us, the sources of what is creating in him a deep, lasting, eternal, true, sincere joy in the Lord. Remember our definition of this joy. Joy in the Lord is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he opens our eyes to behold the beauties and glories of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's true joy. A good feeling in the soul produced supernaturally by the Spirit of God as he opens your eyes to behold the beauties and glories of the person and work of Jesus. Lasting joy, eternal joy. Okay, so we come to see a fifth source of this kind of joy produced by the Holy Spirit, and we see it in verses 17 and 18. So put your eyes on 17. Paul says this, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul wants to see the Philippian Christians in heaven. He so desires the fruit of his ministry to last throughout eternity. And that brings him joy. And today I want to show you three things, very simple things, about this joy. We will see first that it is a joy with a great reward. Secondly, it is a joy worth suffering for. And thirdly, it is a joy to be shared. So let's consider first, this is a joy with a great reward. Let's read from verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Paul desires to know the joy of the Philippians persevering until the end. And with that joy of his perseverance comes for the apostle a reward. What is that reward that comes with this joy? Well, very simply, he says it there. In the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. The New American Standard translates this, that in the day of Christ, I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. The reward for Paul, the reason to glory that accompanies his joy in the Philippians making it to heaven? The reward is a life and a ministry that bore the fruit of eternal salvation. Do you see that? That's the reward. This joy of seeing the Philippians ushered into glory brings with it the reward of a ministry that bore fruit for eternity. Paul's calls for glory 
Paul's reward is that his labors were not in vain. His toiling, his struggling, it produced something. There's a product to show for all of his labor, all of his struggling, all of his toiling. There's something to show for it, namely the fruit of the Philippians' perseverance. Paul was very passionate about not wasting his life or his ministry. He wanted it to count for something. You know, we see this at the very start of Paul's ministry. You don't need to turn there, but listen to this. This is in Galatians 2. Paul's been saved on the road to Damascus. He immediately went into Arabia and then back to Damascus. Then he spent some years away. And listen to this. This is Galatians chapter 2. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus with me. I went up because of a revelation set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential. I set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Paul's saying, after 14 years, he goes up to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles, and he presents to them his gospel. This is the gospel I preach. Now, why does he do that? In order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Paul wanted to ensure that his gospel was not faulty in any way. He wasn't doing this for no purpose, that he was preaching a gospel that wasn't going to bear fruit. He didn't want that. So he checks with them. The other apostles, personally commissioned by Christ to ensure his message is in line with theirs in order to make sure it's not vanity, it's not useless. Paul did not want to waste his life and ministry. He did not want to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ with wood, hay, and stubble. Listen to Paul describe this vanity of ministry in 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3 if anyone, verse 12, if anyone builds on the foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. What Paul's saying is this, there is the foundation of Christ and his gospel, his life, his death, his resurrection. Now, ministers of Christ come along and they build upon that foundation. That's what preaching is. That's what teaching is. That's what building churches is. You're coming and you're laying the foundation of Christ and then you're building upon it with teaching, with instruction. And Paul says you can either do that with precious stones and gold and you build upon it with gold and precious beautiful rubies and gems or you can build upon the foundation of Christ with wood, hay, and stubble. The final day of judgment will reveal, as through fire, how you built on the foundation of Christ. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 14. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Paul is speaking about reward here, reward for ministry, and he wants to live a life that will result in great reward. Paul didn't, from the start of his ministry, want to build on the foundation of Christ with wood, hay, and stubble. That's why he went to the apostles and said, is this gospel the same gospel you're preaching? I don't want to do this in vain. I want this to count for something. I want this to produce something in eternity. There are great rewards for the Christian in heaven for your life and ministry. Now, those rewards will be based on grace. What I mean by that is even in, in us striving and toiling, we're still unworthy servants. It's all of grace. No one in the service of Christ demands rewards from Jesus. But each person's work will be tested. And based upon what you do in ministry, it will either be burned up or you will receive reward. And Paul was absolutely committed 
not to waste his life in ministry. He wanted eternal reward. You say, well, what are the rewards? Well, one such reward of faithful ministry is this. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. What is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Speaking to Thessalonian Christians. For you are our glory and our joy. What is Paul's hope of glory, crown of boasting in the final day? Paul says, church, it's you. You standing there in glory. That's my reward. A faithful ministry. It produced something. Look at them. For Paul, the perseverance and the triumph in grace of the saints was his reward. He wants the reward of eternal fruit. Now, that's, that's not to say, and just here's a balancing truth, that's not to say that faithful laborers in the gospel who labor for years and yet all of their hearers turn deaf ears and reject their gospel, that faithful laborship will be rewarded. So this isn't saying that unless you have a certain number of converts, you're not going to get a reward in glory. No, God rewards his servants for faithful service. But what Paul is saying here is he desires in his ministry the tangible evidence. He desires the tangible fruit. He wants to be able to say, look, here they are standing there. That's the fruit of my labors. The Philippians, they made it. And a point of application under this first heading, how does this apply to us? As we look at Paul saying, this joy has a great reward. Well, it's very simple. Christian, don't waste your life and ministry. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the Father sent the Holy Spirit to anoint believers with the task of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Christian, if you're a Christian, you are a minister of the gospel. What does Peter say? You all, not just me as the pastor, but you all, this guy's got to go. <laughs> He's been buzzing around me. Very... <laughs> we need your son to catch it. Josh Garcia walks in my house and just catches flies. <laughs> but what, is, what does Peter say? He says, you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter doesn't say in 1 Peter 2 that the pastor can proclaim Christ's excellencies. He says you, you're the priesthood, you're the chosen race, you're the nation called to proclaim Christ. Christian, if you're a Christian, you're a minister of the gospel. You have a ministry. You're proclaimers. You're the ones doing the work of the ministry. You know what I am as a pastor? I'm simply a gift given to you to help equip you and teach you to go and do your ministry. That's what he says in Ephesians. He gives pastors, teachers, evangelists to equip the saints for the work of ministry. You are the ministers of the gospel. Christ has entrusted to you the message of reconciliation. You are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through you. Therefore, your life ought to be the life of 2 Corinthians 5, imploring people to be reconciled with God. You know, some will argue that the commission of Christ to take the gospel to the nations was only for the apostles. They do this with poor exegesis and no biblical basis. But it's very simply wrong. Christ says he will be with his disciples until the end of the age. The Great Commission is a commission for all Christians to proclaim the gospel. And we have a really beautiful illustration of this in Acts chapter 8. Why don't you turn to Acts chapter 8 and look at this. In 
immediately after Stephen, the first martyr, was brutally stoned to death in the public square, we read in Acts chapter 8, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So what's going on is the church is being persecuted, and so the church scatters. The apostles, the leaders of the church, stayed put. They didn't scatter. So who was it that scattered? Yeah, the church, the lay people, just the normal, everyday members of the church. Look at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. It wasn't just the apostles. Get up and preach, preacher. No, it was the church. They were doing the work of ministry. And so the application of this first point, this joy of Paul seeing the Philippians make it to the end, it comes with a great reward. This applies to us how? Because you have been made an ambassador for Christ. So Christian, don't build upon the foundation of Christ with wood, hay, and stubble. Share. I'm inviting you today to come and share the passion of Paul. I won't waste my ministry. It won't be in vain. I won't live this life for nothing I want fruit at the end of the day. I want to see ushered into glory those whom I led to Christ through my faithful witness. Paul's joy in the Philippians' perseverance was a joy accompanied by a great reward. The reward of a life in ministry not wasted. And that needs to be the passion shared by each one of us. You've been entrusted with the gospel. You realize that? Angels could come from heaven right now and boldly, clearly, explicitly declare the gospel to every single human soul on earth in a moment. But that is not how Jesus has chosen to share his message. He's taken this message of reconciliation that men can be made right with God and he's put it into the hands of men, women, and children, and said, here, you share it. Don't waste your ministry, Christian. For the joy of perseverance comes with great reward, a ministry not wasted. Secondly, consider with me that this joy of Paul's is a joy worth suffering for. Remember, the goal is Paul is the Philippians' perseverance to the end, their salvation. This will bring Paul joy. And then Paul writes these words in verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. He so wants to experience the joy of the Philippians' perseverance that he says, even if I'm poured out, or because I'm being poured out, you could translate it, I rejoice with you all. Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, I rejoice. In other words... This joy that Paul wants to experience is worth suffering for. Even if I'm being a sacrifice, I want that joy. The picture of a sacrifice and a drink offering is not a pretty one. Sacrifices, just in general, aren't a pretty picture. It's the slaughtering of an animal being placed upon an altar. But it's not just any sacrifice that Paul speaks of. Paul uses a specific term here that references a certain dimension of sacrifice, namely a libation. And what a libation was, and the Philippians would have been familiar with it, when the priest sacrificed the animal and put him on the altar, he would then take a glass of wine and pour it upon the altar. That was the libation. And because of the heat of the altar, it would immediately evaporate and and go up, and it was meant to give a pleasing aroma to the one to whom the sacrifices were being made. And so notice what Paul says. It's literally a libation. He says, even if I'm the wine poured out onto the steaming hot altar, I am glad 
and rejoice with you all. Paul's point is clear. Even if I have to suffer. Now there's a side note. He's, he's really in an act of humility saying that the Philippians are the ones really bringing the sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of their faith, their lives entrusted to God. They're the ones who are offering themselves on the altar. Paul comes along and says, I'm just the, the libation poured on top of the offering of your faith, the sacrifice of your faith. It's a really a, a humble statement of Paul. He's really commending the Philippians for their service. But even so, the point is clear. Paul is saying, I'm willing even to sacrifice to experience this joy of your perseverance. Paul is willing to suffer. He's willing to labor and be poured out and to expend himself. He says this in the second book of, or the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, verse 15. He says, I will most gladly be spent and spend for your souls. Paul says, I'm, gl- I'm willing to give myself up for the sake of your souls. And we know this about Paul, don't we? Paul was a man who in his ministry suffered greatly. Many of us are familiar, perhaps, with the chilling litany of sufferings that Paul rattles off in 2 Corinthians 11. Why don't we turn there? Go to 2 Corinthians 11. We'll skim, we'll skim them quickly. But there's this, this litany of sufferings that if you let yourself be enveloped by it, it'll send a chill down your spine of what the Apostle Paul endured for the sake of the saints and the gospel. Look at chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians verse 23. What do we see there? Greater labors, imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Look at verse 24. Five times whipped by the Jews. Verse 25. Three times beaten with rods. He was stoned once in Lystra, dragged out of the city as dead. Three times shipwrecked, a day and a night, adrift at sea. Verse 26, he was in danger from rivers, robbers, his own people. You realize at one time, we're told in Acts 23, that more than 40 Jews swore not to eat or drink until they'd killed Paul. His own people. In danger from Gentiles, in danger from the city, from the wilderness, the sea, false brothers. Look at verse 27. Toils and hardships, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Verse 28. And the added anxiety he bore daily for all the churches. Paul suffered greatly. Now turn back just a few pages to 2 Corinthians 4. I want to show you this text in order to reinforce or buttress what Paul is telling us in Philippians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 4. Now watch this. Verse 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. What Paul is saying there is that him and Timothy are suffering. They're perplexed, they're beaten down, they're crushed, they're persecuted, they're afflicted in every way. Suffering. But look at verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies, For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. See what he just said? He's recounting how much he's suffering, and he says, yeah, death is working in us. We're being being crushed. We're being beaten. This is not the American dream. Death is working in us, but life is working in you. Paul is saying, I'm suffering for the sake of something. Something greater than my suffering. Something worth more than my comfort. Namely, Life 
being worked in the Christian. Life is being produced. What kind of life is this? Look at verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. And notice this, and bring us with you into His presence. For it is all for your sake that, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. The result of Paul's ministry, the result of his suffering, death being worked in him, is life in the Corinthians. What kind of life? Life that results with them being ushered into glory. That's the result. That's the fruit of this life. Though it's a ministry plagued by suffering, it's worth it for the joy of perseverance with the church. Do you see that? It's worth suffering if life will be produced in you that will be eternal. Now let's go back to our text in Philippians. You can turn back to Philippians 2. Paul just wants them innocent and blameless. Without blemish, so that, look there in verse 16, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering. Paul's saying, I just want life in you, life that results in you being brought into the presence of Jesus. I want life produced in you that will live for eternity. And so desperately does he desire it, he says, I'll even suffer. It's worth suffering. Let me connect some dots for us here today and how this applies to us. Paul suffered to bring the gospel to the Philippians. We remember that in Acts 16, don't we? As he's bringing the gospel, he's beaten and thrown in jail. Now he's writing to them whilst in chains in Rome. Paul suffered to bring the gospel to the church in Philippi and to many churches across Asia and Europe. And church, I want you to know that the gospel truths, which for many the Holy Spirit has used to regenerate your souls, the gospel truths that you love and know have sailed down to us in this generation upon a sea of blood. The blood of the saints who have gone before us. The gospel has only come to us as a church today through suffering. Whether it was the apostles who history tells us predominantly all of them died brutal deaths as martyrs. Whether it was through those Christians who in Acts 8 scattered throughout the lands being cut down brutally. Whether it was the early Christians in Rome who were tortured and killed by Nero. The gospel truths that you know and love have sailed down to us on the sea of blood, the blood of the saints. Think of the Protestants under Queen Mary in the 16th century in England or the French Huguenots in the same time period in France. In a matter of days, 40 to 100,000 French Protestants slaughtered. Think of the beatings and the threats upon those like Howell Harris, the great evangelist of the Great Awakening, mocked, beaten, ridiculed, thrown in the dirt to preserve and to preach and to bring the gospel to the people. The gospel your ears and mine have heard when we were dead in our sins have sailed down to us, not on the waters of ease, comfort, and convenience. It is a gospel that sailed down to us on a sea of blood. Why? Because those who have gone before us throughout the centuries have shared the passion and the conviction of Paul. Namely, even if I'm to be poured out, 
as a drink offering upon the sacrifice of your faith, I rejoice and I'm glad. Do you see that? It's worth suffering for. To bring the gospel. That's the only reason we have the gospel in our hands today. Because the saints throughout history have counted this a joy worth suffering for. And my question to you, do you share the same passion? Not only for your own soul to make it to the end, but for the souls of others to make it to the end. Are you willing to suffer? First of all, are you even willing to suffer for yourself? This means saying no to your flesh, and like Paul, disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness, renouncing earthly delights and pleasures. Are you even willing to suffer for the sake of your soul making it to heaven? Are you? Or do you take and drink down the temporal delights of the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, knowing that Christ says, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, or go to hell with your hand and your eyeball firmly attached. Christian, it takes suffering to persevere. Paul says, I beat my body, I make it my slave, so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. Paul says, it takes suffering to make it. Do you care enough about your own soul making it, that you're willing to cut off the hand? And pluck out the eye of the lust of your flesh. But further, are you willing to suffer to see others persevere? Is the joy of not only yourself, but others entering the course of glory a joy for which you're willing to suffer? Or do those who shepherd and care for your souls care more to see you make it to the final day than you do? You know, I pray every week for each of you in this church that the Lord would convict you of sin and that the Lord would show you your sin and that the Lord would lead you out of it and that you would put sin to death I pray that for you Lord search them and know them and show them their, the hurtful way and lead them in the path of life do you pray that for yourself or do those who oversee and shepherd your souls care more that you would make it to the end than even you do? Are others more willing to suffer to see you make it to heaven than you yourself are? Church, may we share this passion Paul had to rejoice in the perseverance of the saints to such a degree that we would be willing to suffer just to experience that joy. Well, thirdly and finally, this joy of the Apostle Paul seeing the Philippians endure is a joy to be shared. Look at verse, the end of verse 17 and verse 18. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. That word translated with is the Greek word sug kairo, and it describes a deep fellowship and a mutuality in feeling. And for Paul, this is top priority. Philippians, in fact, is known as a fellowship letter. Over and over, Paul is all about partnership and fellowship. If you think of Philippians 1.7, he talks about sug koinonas, which means fellow fellowshippers. In chapter 1, verse 27, he talks about being sun athleto, athletes together, fellow athletes striving side by side. Paul is all about fellowship in the Philippian letter. Over and over, he refers to having fellowship in the Spirit, being fellow workers and fellow soldiers in 2.25. In 3.10, he says that we should share, be fellowshipping in sufferings together. In 3.17, he says fellowship in imitating Christ. Paul is all about fellowship and partnership with the saints. And it's no different here. Paul's joy in the perseverance of the saints is not a joy he desires to experience alone. And so it is, and ought to be, with each of us. I want you to know that my desire as your pastor is ultimately that you would make it to the end. My calling is to aid you on this 
journey to glory. That's my burden. You realize I, and any pastor, a true pastor, they just want to stand in the final day with their sheep. That's my burden. I want to stand in the final day before the great white throne of judgment and have you next to me. And be able to say, they made it. (laughs) They're with me. They're ushered in. And to hear not just those words from me, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will make you, put you over much, in charge over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Not just spoken to me. I want to hear those words spoken to you. And to you, and to you. I want you to enter into glory with me. That's the burden of a pastor. That's the joy in the perseverance of the saints. What greater joy is there for a minister of the gospel? John, in second, third John, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to know that my children are walking in the truth. What good is it, the hours of sermon preparation? What good is it, the devotion to counseling and to walking and to sharing and to talking and to ministering and to pouring out. What good is that of a pastor or a shepherd or any one of you in the lives of the others if it doesn't result in eternal glorification? It's all vanity in that sense. Now, not in the sense of faithfully serving the Lord. There's reward there whether the people hear it or not. Everybody didn't listen. Nobody listened to Jeremiah. Jeremiah received the reward for his suffering. But for Paul, joy, he sees it. And he says, Philippians, as I say to you today, church in Laredo, there's a joy for me to experience if you make it to the end in glory. I can look and say, look at the fruit of ministry. I poured out my life. I served. I labored. I toiled. I struggled. And they're there. They made it into glory. And you can share that joy with me and with one another as you, each ministers of the gospel, can look to the other and say, I discipled that young woman. I discipled that young man. I came alongside that brother entangled in sin and I pulled him from the snares. I walked along. I ministered. And they're with me in glory. That is a source of joy in the Lord. And that's not a worldly joy that flees as quickly as it came. Like the pleasures of the flesh that this world offers. That is a joy which will last for eternity. Well... That's the goal. It's the heartfelt desire of the Apostle Paul. He started out the letter this way. In chapter 1, verse 9. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That's Paul's desire. And it's my desire for you that we together would experience the joy of the perseverance of the saints to the final day. Well, let's pray. Father, oh God, please burn these truths unto the hearts and minds of its hearers. And Father, please preserve us to the final day. I ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.